All right, welcome uh, Math 13 students. Uh, today I wanna to spend just a few minutes, <clears throat> a few minutes uh, discussing the beginnings of chapter eight. Uh, chapter eight introduces the notion of a hypothesis test. or test of hypothesis. All right, <clears throat> and in some sense, this is what we've been working towards all semester long. This is why we talk about summary statistics and way back in the first part. This is why we talk about probability and distributions in the middle part. It's all to get us ready uh, to handle the notion of what we call a test of hypothesis. This is how science gets stuff done. <clears throat> this is how things are quote unquote shown or proven to be likely. <clears throat> um, and uh, we go on from there. So before I even go ahead and um, talk about statistics, I want to introduce the analogy that I will use throughout chapter eight. And it's an analogy uh, that most people are pretty familiar with, um, although there are some aspects uh, that are honestly quite subtle that we really don't spend enough time on. But <clears throat> the uh, test of hypothesis is very, very similar in structure to <clears throat> a criminal court case, and honestly, civil court too. But I like criminal court because we all watch uh, TVs and videos. We know all about uh, courtroom scenes and drama. So they kind of resonate. <laughs> the nice thing is the uh, example is very, very apt and appropriate. Basically change the names and everything lines up. All right. <clears throat> If you ask anyone, <clears throat> anyone um, who's watched TV or <laughs> unfortunately has been charged with a crime, what's the first thing that you hear when a person is charged with a crime and is going to be tried in a public trial? It's always innocent until proven guilty. Um, and that's a nice saying, although that is actually not what really, truly, quite honestly happens in a court case. <clears throat> a court case is slightly different. This notion of innocent until proven guilty really captures the uh, detail of what happens when the uh, jury comes back with the verdict. But <clears throat> in reality, what happens is this. In a court case, we start with Well, let's see. <clears throat> we don't start with innocent because a jury never comes back with a verdict of innocent. No, a jury comes back with one of two verdicts. <clears throat> Not guilty or guilty. <clears throat> and I think what some people kind of tend to forget when it comes to court cases in general is they do not prove innocence at all. That's not what they do. What a court case does, it decides if there is enough evidence to move the needle from not guilty to guilty, <clears throat> right? So it's very much like, well, like a speedometer or a needle. Not guilty, guilty. On the very first day of the trial, no one has heard a single piece of evidence. <clears throat> so on the very first day of trial, <clears throat> the arrow points at not guilty. But what happens? Evidence is introduced. And as evidence is introduced by the, by, excuse me, by the prosecution, 
the probability that a person is guilty increases. <clears throat> but then the defense has its say, and it might decrease or even increase even more. But the point is <clears throat> that as evidence accrues, <clears throat> there comes a point on this sort of weird little scale where the jury will decide between not guilty and guilty. <clears throat> if the needle doesn't get that far, they come back with not guilty. If the needle gets this far or further, they're gonna come back with guilty. So <clears throat> a test of hypothesis is very, very much like this. We start with something very similar to the not guilty verdict. <clears throat> We have statistical evidence, our sample data. And if the sample data is strong enough, we will move from the notion of not guilty to the notion of guilty. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? This is really where the analogy part needs to switch just a little bit, but not quite yet. Let's talk a little bit before I go uh, and talk about statistics. Let's not leave the court case just yet. <clears throat> let's talk about error and outcomes. <clears throat> I have this drawn in a couple of different places. Uh, <clears throat> but um, on, on our Canvas course shell. Um, there's our jury. So the jury comes back with either guilty or not guilty. Those are the two options. <clears throat> but <clears throat> that's their take on reality. What really happened? <clears throat> and really, ha what really happened, <clears throat> maybe the person was innocent or maybe the person was really guilty. And let's talk a little bit about when juries get things right and when juries get things wrong. <clears throat> so if my jury comes back with a notion of guilty, yet the person in question is innocent, and yes, we all know that happens, has the jury done the right thing? No, the jury has made an error. I'm going to call that error number one. <clears throat> <clears throat> On the other hand, if the jury comes back with a guilty verdict and the person really did commit the crime, then the verdict is correct. And everyone, well, I won't say everyone's happy, but uh, justice has been rendered. Maybe the jury comes back with not guilty and the person is innocent. Here again, the correct answer or result has been achieved. Finally, <clears throat> the jury might come back with not guilty, and yet the person in question really did commit the crime. I'm sure we can think of examples of that. Here again, we have some sort of error, and I'm going to call that the type two error. I'm not going to go into any detail about why one and why two right now, but I just want people to realize that we are going to encounter the same sort of scenario when it comes to these tests of hypothesis. There will be two possible outcomes. There will be data. 
<clears throat> and the data will tell me what to do. And I might be correct or I might make an error. Now, there's one other important thing about this analogy, and it does hold <clears throat> for all the material that we look at. In society, we do not treat these two errors as equivalent or the same. <clears throat> there are all sorts of rules in our criminal court proceedings about what you can and cannot do in an attempt to convict someone. <clears throat> Warrants have to be legal. <clears throat> they need to be tried by a jury of their peers. Um, <clears throat> witnesses need to be able to be uh, cross-examined. <clears throat> so there's a lot of emphasis put on making sure that the type one error does not happen. Here's the problem. You cannot make both of these small at the same time. The less you have of one, the more you have of the other and vice versa. And for example, if you did not want any innocent person to ever spend any time in jail and no one ever should, <clears throat> well, we could do that. We'll just make sure we come back with a not guilty verdict in every single case. But then a bunch of guilty people go free. <clears throat> Maybe we don't want the guilty to go free. Maybe we want, we want to punish the guilty and make sure they get punished. Well, that's easy to deal with too. <clears throat> every time we get a case, we come back with guilty. <clears throat> and the innocent has not gone free. Well, excuse me, the guilty has not gone free, but a lot of innocent people are also in jail. So it's a balance. The more you have of one, the less you have of the other. And we, we minimize <clears throat> error one <clears throat> at the expense of error two. In other words, as a society, and I really can't say it's wrong either, as a society, um, it's really important that uh, innocent people do not spend time in jail. Really, really important. Uh, in fact, a lot of that's really what is at the basis of things like Black Lives Matter, man. Because <clears throat> there's a little bit too much type one error happening. <clears throat> but in any case, uh, the same general scenario is what works with a test of hypothesis. <clears throat> so let me put that aside for a moment and try to lay out the basics of a hypothesis test. <clears throat> and then at that point, I think I'm going to stop <clears throat> and then I'll pick it up again uh, when we get together on Monday. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, the first thing I will note is that a test of hypothesis has two hypotheses, just like a court case has two hypotheses, guilty and not guilty. <clears throat> the first of our hypotheses is called the null hypothesis. This is very, very, very similar to the not guilty verdict. And that's where every trial starts. And the null hypothesis is where every test of hypothesis starts. And then we have the we have the alternative hypothesis. And this is pretty much identical to the guilty verdict. 
So there are two hypotheses. We start with the null hypothesis. And then if the evidence is strong enough, So <clears throat> as that evidence uh, accrues and moves that needle, there will be a certain place where if the evidence is stronger, we essentially reject that null hypothesis. <clears throat> if the evidence doesn't reach that level, we <clears throat> keep. keep the null hypothesis. There's more to it than that. That's a, really an oversimplification. There's some important vocabulary and uh, concepts that are involved in this. But at the end of the day, that's really the way this thing works. And we begin with the null hypothesis, we gather our sample data, and then we decide if the data is strong enough to warrant rejecting the null hypothesis and going with the alternative. <clears throat> Although very much like any court case, we could make each one of those kinds of errors. And I'll talk more about that uh, next time we're together. <clears throat> but for now, realize that this is the process that we are going to be working towards. Now, One or two more things. <clears throat> First, how far is the needle moved? In other words, <clears throat> how good is the data? <clears throat> we have something that measures how far the needle is moved, and we call this, and I'm going to define these more properly uh, next time that we are together. We have something called the test statistic. <clears throat> so how far is the needle moved? We have what we call the test statistic. <clears throat> and I will make this much more explicit on Monday. The other question is, how far does it need to move to reject the null hypothesis? That's the second big question. <clears throat> that is given to us by what we call the level of significance. That level of significance. You've actually already encountered this level of significance. <clears throat> we encounter it with a slightly different name in uh, chapter seven. The level of significance, this is alpha. <clears throat> and the level of significance is one minus alpha, just like we looked at in the uh, 7.1. So we've actually seen some of this before. In fact, in a pinch, the material in seven can be manipulated to answer questions in chapter eight, but uh, we have special tools or dedicated tools, I should say. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and say more on this the next time we are together and uh, really start to lay things out. Uh, a little bit about the chapter eight material. 
Um, I'm not a very big fan of the way our author, <clears throat> um, the way our author puts together uh, the material for chapter eight. Uh, 8.1, section 8.1 is a very challenging section. He packs 8.1 with absolutely every notion, thought, and formula you need for all of chapter eight. We only do 8.1 and 8.2 and 8.3. We do not do 8.4. So I've got to be very sure students uh, pick up the correct things from uh, section 8.1. So let me go ahead and stop my recording. <clears throat>